All right, Acts 15. Acts 15 is a, a very interesting chapter. And what we see in chapter 15 is we see a few examples of clashes or contentions that Paul experiences within the early church. And I'll show you three as, you, uh, as we talk through Acts chapter 15 and we'll draw some lessons from it this morning. All right, so the first part of Acts chapter 15 is a clash of doctrines, a clash of doctrines. Right, Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So this is actually a clash of doctrines that was a heretical doctrine, right? Because it was work salvation, salvation by works versus salvation by grace. So this is a big deal, right? And this is why it says here in verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation. So translation, they had a big dissension and disputation. When the Bible says no small, and it's funny that sometimes the King James Bible, the way it phrases things is, you know, being a bit more polite about things. It's like the English being more polite. No small dissension, saying they had a very big fight about this. So dissenting is when you disagree and dispute is when you're actually arguing against them, right? So when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So this is a big deal that's happening in this Antioch church and he addresses it with Galatians too. And we're going to uh, cross-reference a lot of passages from Galatians to so Galatians was also a church where people were creeping in and teaching work salvation, telling them that they needed to be circumcised to be saved. And we see a, the, the theme throughout Galatians all about work salvation. It's one of the few letters, or well, it's the, uh, the only one I know of actually, that Paul actually wrote with his own hand because the other letters Paul actually delivered and somebody else wrote them. But the one that Paul wrote with his own hand, he says, our larger letter I've written with my own hand was a letter defending salvation by grace against work salvation, particularly those saying that you had to be circumcised to be saved. So there's, he addresses this sort of situation in Galatians 15. Uh, in, Galatians, in Galatians, it's happening in Acts 15. So a false gospel is a big deal. And I'm always reminded um, of this situation I was in when I was younger and I was going to a Bible Presbyterian church at the time. We went to a camp and, you know, at camp, sometimes a lot of young people, you know, they're, they're thinking about salvation, they're thinking about whether to get saved or not. And I remember talking to this one guy, and uh, he wasn't a believer yet, and I said, you know, what's, what's stopping you from getting saved? Uh, what's stopping you from believing? And his answer was, you know, I'm just not, not, I just don't know if I'm ready to commit. I just don't know if I'm ready to make that change in my life. And... I, and I remember saying, like, gosh, because I wanted this guy to get saved so bad, I was saying, like, man, you don't need to give up all those things to be saved. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, a free gift. And then after, you know, then God's going to help you change up your life. Now, little did I know at the time, that was not the view of everyone in the church. And then he went, you know, back to, you know, because in, you know, these, cam in these camps, you've got, like, these little groups that you break up into, you know, and then you do your Bible studies together. So he sits in his group, and, and, you know, obviously people are trying to encourage him to get saved and telling him he has to repent of his sins. And, give up. and then he says to them, yeah, but Victor told me that, you know, you don't have to give up all these things to be saved. And then there was a big, there was no small dissension and disputation, I'll tell you that, at that camp. And um, anyways, and it got addressed by the, because we were all teenagers back then. You know, I was a oh, teenager, I was, in, I was in my early 20s. So it was like a young people's kind of camp. But that became a big fight in that church. And that was, uh, you know, I, I realized in that church, not everyone agreed. Some people, you know, because we were giving out the chick tracks. And the chick tracks said, repent, turn from your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember when this issue came up, I remember going to people and saying, do you realize that the tracks we're giving out is preaching a work salvation? And some people said, man, you're right. And other people said, no, no, you need to turn from your sins to be saved. So it became, you know, this, this sort of uh, heresy arose to the surface. We realized that, that, you know, there was a dispute here, just like what is happening here. So Paul kind of uh, 
you know, so, so, a, so, so where was I? So a false gospel is a big deal. This is no small thing. This is no small dissension and disputation. Uh, Galatians 1.6, look at what Paul writes here. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And I feel the same way when I start hearing people talk about, you know, oh, they need to commit to Christ, make Jesus the Lord of life to be saved, repent of all their sins. And I feel like, did you not understand salvation by grace? It's like, here, yeah, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Why is he saying that? Because there isn't different gospels. There's only one gospel. The other gospels are false gospels. But there would be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So why is that? Because preaching a false gospel will send people to hell. And he's saying here, it doesn't matter who it comes from. That's why Paul says, it doesn't matter where this message came from. It doesn't matter who they are. So, though we are an angel, right? They could be somebody famous. They could be somebody influential. It doesn't matter who it comes from. He says, let them be accursed if they are preaching another gospel. Don't hear that gospel out. Salvation is by grace. So this is no small deal, right? This, preaching a false gospel is a big deal because people's eternal salvation is at stake. This is why, you know, when we talk about salvation, you know, this church, I think, you know, we take it for granted that salvation is just clearly preached here. I don't think there's many preachers, unfortunately, in Sydney that preach salvation as clearly as we do here. And sometimes it may seem like we are splitting hairs on things, but it's because that's, this is how important it is. And if people don't get it right, you know, they, they, they may not understand salvation correctly. So this is a big deal and it's something worth fighting for. Galatians 5.2, why is it important that we believe salvation by grace, not by works? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So we don't have that issue today amongst maybe our circle of influence of, you know, circumcision, people thinking circumcision will get you saved. But I'll tell you what, there's probably people in your family circles, those of you from Orthodox and Catholic backgrounds, they think baptism saves. You know, they baptize their kids and you'll hear them say things like, oh yeah, well it can't hurt. Can't hurt that they get their sins washed away, you know. So just, uh, you know, plan B, in case they're not saved, you know, they're baptized, they have their sins washed away. Because what you've got to realize is it's not a plan B, right? If you think baptism washes away some sins, just put baptism in place of circumcision here. It says, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why? For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So what is he saying here? It's not just the fact that they're circumcised. It's that they're trusting circumcision to get them saved. If somebody thinks baptism or some other thing or even communion somehow washes away your sins, he's warning you here and saying, hey, if you think you've got to keep a commandment, to get to heaven, he's saying it, you've got to keep every commandment. That's what he's saying. He's a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And that's why we say when we preach the gospel, it's not you do some of it, you do your part, Jesus does his part. Because if you have to do a part, you have to do the whole part. That's what Galatians 5 is teaching. Now Paul recounts this event in Acts 15 in Galatians 2. It says here, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So it's interesting that Paul, like he says, he's wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove in how he communicates the gospel to different people and those in reputation, those are how he does it more privately. You know, So he goes up there with Titus and we see there in Acts 15 how he's telling them, hey, this is what I've been preaching, this is what I've been doing with the Gentiles. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in. So now you can see uh, a bit of insight into Paul's mind 
when it says he had no small dissension and disputation. He's like, these guys coming to you know, the church in Antioch and preaching that you had to be circumcised to be saved, he's like, they're false brethren. And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection? No, not for an hour. He says, we didn't even let this go on for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. It's say, they come in, maybe they think they're all, you know, staff or learned. It's like going back to Galatians uh, 1. Though we are an angel, preach any other gospel, let him be a curse. He's saying here, it doesn't matter who they were. It maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference... What does that mean? So it's like when they're gathered together and they seem like people who are important. Added nothing to me, right? So he's saying here, it doesn't matter who they are. So this is something worth fighting for. And Jude has a similar theme here with what Paul is saying. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So you see here, as Christians, we need to be wise how we speak, how we contend. But we never want to have this mindset that it's wrong to contend, that it's wrong to fight for what's right, that it's wrong to dispute and to dissent and to disagree and say, no, 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 wait, that's wrong, you know, and, and to stand up for what is right. Here, Jude is exhorting people, hey, you, it's needful for him to write to them and exhort them, right? He's trying to encourage them that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. See, we should be fighting for what is true and what is right. For there are certain men crept in, and here's that same word, unawares, false brethren unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one thing I want to say here is, you know, look, people can get mixed up in work salvation. People can get, get mixed up on doctrine. So it's not just like anyone who's just mixed up on things. You know, you're just like, you false prophet, false wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, we're saying these are people that they came in, they had a certain agenda, right? They're not just coming and learning, it's just a bit mixed up on things, right? So you need to be a bit wise about that too. That just because somebody's a bit mixed up on some things, maybe you've got some false doctrine, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the description of Jews. But Paul knew that those coming into Galatia were like this. That's why in, Gal in the Galatian letter, he says, false brethren. He actually accused them, saying that they are not saved people. But look here, Acts 15, 3, brought, being brought on their way by the church, so I think that's what it means. They're, they're supported as they go, right? The different churches, as they pass through, they're, they're probably fed and given stuff to, to, in order to travel this journey back to Jerusalem. They pass through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they cause great joy unto all the brethren. Right? So it's a great thing, hearing about people getting saved, hearing about people walking in the Lord. You know, in, uh, the, in the epistles of John, I can't remember which one exactly, it's second, uh, second epistle or third epistle of John, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Isn't that an interesting thing? We, we, think, we think the most joyful thing is somebody getting saved. I don't, I don't, I don't agree. Yeah, it's not, that's not the most joyful thing. Is it a joyful thing that people get saved? Absolutely. But God says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children work, walk in truth. So you know, you, you bring more joy to God walking in truth than just being saved. Did you know that? So even though salvation is a big deal, that's not the thing that brings God the most joy. God gets the most joy when we walk in truth. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received with the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But, look at this, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, look at this, which believed. So are these Pharisees saved or not saved? They are saved, right? Saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So can you see here that even saved people can have wrong doctrine? You see, so just because somebody has wrong doctrine, that doesn't automatically make them a wolf in sheep's clothing. But maybe some wolf in sheep's clothing are a bit more obvious than others, right? When they come in with a bad agenda. But can people get mixed up on false doctrine? They can. People can get caught up 
in work salvation. And then when you have like ministries like, like Living Waters out there and you have people like Paul Washer preaching Lordship Salvation, John MacArthur preaching Lordship Salvation, if you're truly saved, you're going to submit to his Lordship and blah, blah, blah. People start getting mixed up into all this work salvation. That's what I'm saying. Like, this doesn't happen here because you have a preacher that doesn't like just have this type of sloppy preaching, right? That just like keeps saying things like, oh, if you want to be saved, commit your life to Jesus. I'll make sure you repent of all your sins to be saved. So the congregation doesn't walk away thinking, oh yeah, well, I'm saved because I've got the right desires. I'm saved because I made a change in my life. I'm saved because I'm walking with the Lord. But that happens in other churches where they get a, a, a mixed message from the pulpit and they walk away and they think that the reason why they're saved is because they're walking with the Lord as opposed to they believed on Jesus Christ. They've accepted the grace freely from Jesus Christ. So saved people can get mixed up in work salvation. Does it mean they're not saved necessarily? No, right? Because people can believe wrong things. They can't lose their salvation because salvation is eternal. Now Galatians 5 here, we see a list of the works of the flesh. And you'll notice here, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and look at this one, heresies, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, and I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So I don't think Paul is uh, very lackadaisical about how he accuses people of being false brethren. So I think this is a very big deal, this, these people coming into the Antioch church and uh, with this agenda. But it shows here that you know, people even who believed can have wrong doctrine. So that's why you need to understand that people that have false doctrine, they can fit into one of two categories, right? They can either be somebody who's not saved, preaching a false gospel, or they can be somebody that's saved, being caught up in the false gospel, just like, you know, the, people, the Pharisees of Jerusalem, and just like some people in Galatians, in the Galatian church, started believing in work salvation again. And that's why he says to them, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Now, how then should we, I guess, uh, think of those uh, that potential, like that, that believe in work salvation. What should you think of someone who's, was, you know, as far as you know, saved, but is now confessing work salvation? Well, we get some guidance because people ask me, like, well, then what then if somebody says they're saved and now they're a Buddhist, or somebody says they're saved and you know now they're like an atheist? How should we think of them? Well, I think we get some direction in Galatians because look at how Paul thinks of the Galatians. He says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. So I don't think it's wrong to say I'm doubt whether that person is saved. If they, you know, if they said they were saved and now they're an atheist, maybe they're not saved. Does that mean they're definitely not saved? No, because they could be somebody who was saved and just getting mixed up in false teaching. But it's not wrong to doubt their salvation based on the things that they're professing, just like Paul did. That's why he's saying he wants to go be with the Galatians and talk with them again, because he's saying, you know, maybe i got to go there and travail again until Christ be formed in you, because I'm doubting whether you guys actually are saved. Galatians 6.11. Galatians 6.11. And look what he says here. Anyone who believes in work salvation are ultimately hypocrites themselves. Because you can't believe in work salvation and require works, and then the amount of works required is the whole law, and think you're saved by work salvation. Galatians 6.11, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. So like I said here, this is an important topic. Paul wrote this letter with his own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So he's saying here's their, their motivation he's talking about because if they say that they don't have to be circumcised then they're going to be persecuted amongst the Jews. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So he's saying that they're trying to get you to keep the law but they don't keep the law themselves. 
And that's always the case with people that believe work salvation. You know, they want you to keep the law, they're not keeping the law either. So we're all condemned under the law. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So you can see there, when you read Galatians, along with what's happening in Acts 15 and that whole dispute, it puts Galatians into context. And you'll notice that Galatians is touching on many of the topics of that dispute in Acts 15. So what's the lesson from this first section? One is, you know, understand salvation well. Make sure you understand it well. It's the one doctrine, if any, you should know inside out. You know, because that one's the most important, right? And beware of work salvation, because it can come in many subtle forms. You know, give your life to Jesus to be saved. Turn over a new leaf to be saved. Repent of your sins to be saved. What's another one? Make Jesus the Lord of your life to be saved. You know, you just need to do your part to be saved. Oh, you can't live like that and be saved. Oh, yeah, well, maybe you quit church. Well, maybe you were never saved. You know, like it's all, it's bringing, bringing works back into salvation. You know, but these are all subtle forms of works. Salvation. Don't get caught up in them. Salvation's by grace. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once saved, always saved. All right, second section. So we had the clash of doctrines. This second section is the larger section, right? Clash of cultures. The clash of cultures. Acts 15, 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up. So, you know, this reminds me a bit sometimes of our church. You know, me and Ashton are going out. Maybe Ashton and Nate going out. Well, you know, you get to church, something to, 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 to argue over. There's much disputing. So they go to Jerusalem, there's much disputing. All right? They got things to talk about, things to discuss. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So you remember when we looked at back at the book of Acts, that was Peter going to the Gentiles, Holy Ghost falling on them, giving the gift of tongues, showing that, hey, they, they are given this gift just as much as the, the, the Jews are given this gift. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, so this is what he's referring to, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So when I think about these disputations, disagreement can be a good thing in a church. You don't necessarily want a church without any disagreement at all. And the reason is because disagreements bring the disagreements to the surface. And sometimes you may not realize that you are holding to some heretical beliefs, but if the disagreement comes up, then it, then it arises to the surface. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. This is uh, the passage that we read also with uh, the, you know, the Lord's Supper, communion. But there was a lot of division in the Corinthian church. Look what he says here. But first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So sometimes dispute and, and just disagreement is good when people are disputing and talking about doctrine because you, you don't want to be holding on to some false belief and then not realize that you are. But when it gets talked about, then the differences rise to the surface. Like I talked about that church I was going to. It's like, okay, it was good there was a disagreement because now people have to reflect on, do they actually understand salvation right? And there were, like in the Corinthian church, there were heresies being believed in that church. Now it can be addressed. Now people can actually think, do they have the right position or not, at least some people may be corrected. And I think thankfully some people were. Acts 15.10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now notice here in verse 10 to 12, it says here that there was a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Now Katerina was asking me recently about salvation in the Old Testament. A lot of people wonder about what salvation in the Old Testament is like. Sometimes they're, you know, believing in like dispensationalism, they think it's work salvation in the Old Testament, or they just think, well, how were people in the Old Testament saved because they were before Jesus? 
So, you know, the answer to that is, well, they're still looking to the grace of God, just like we're looking to the grace of God. It's just that they're looking to the prophecy being fulfilled as opposed to we looking back, it was already fulfilled, but ultimately it was the promise of God. But here you can see in Acts 15 that this is another passage that shows, no, the salvation in the Old Testament was the same as the salvation in the New Testament. Because he's saying here, hey, the work salvation and the circumcision, which this is the current dispute here in Acts 15, he's saying we couldn't keep the works, we shouldn't make the Gentiles keep the works, but he says, hey, not, not even our fathers before us were able to keep the works. So if salvation in the Old Testament was by works, then no, nobody's getting saved, right? He's saying here, because they weren't able to bear it, we're not able to bear it. Why are we putting this yoke on the Gentiles when we can't and our fathers can't bear it either? So salvation has always been by grace. And this is another theme, even in Galatians. why you can go to Galatians so much as you cross-reference Acts 15. He says here to the Galatians, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. So he's saying, we're Jews, we know the teaching, salvation by grace, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, if Paul's saying by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, how can we believe that in the Old Testament all these people were justified by works? Nobody's justified by works. So nobody in the Old Testament is justified by works either. And even in Acts 15... Paul is saying here, yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Romans 4. Romans 4 is a good passage on salvation by grace. And it actually uses two Old Testament figures. Right? What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So if salvation was by works in the Old Testament. How can Paul, in the Roman epistle, use two Old Testament figures to say, hey, look at the, how these guys were saved. That's how we're saved. They are actually examples of how we're saved because salvation is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. People just get confused because in Old Testament scriptures, there's preaching of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is keep the works and be blessed. Don't keep the works and you're cursed. But that's not the full picture because the full picture is everyone's under the curse because we cannot keep the works. That's why we need the covenant of grace. But then you just see the preaching of both in the Old Testament. That's why people, or, you know, if people want to believe work salvation, the verses are there because they just got to look at Old Testament verses, right? Of Old Covenant verses. But it's not the full picture. The full picture is because we can't keep the Old Covenant, that's why we need grace. That's why we needed Jesus Christ to die for us. And this is what Romans 4 is talking about. That that blessedness, that imputed righteousness comes to us by faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 15, 13. This is James now, his response to the situation. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophet as it is written. So he's saying this is not just, now he's referencing the Old Testament and saying this is not just what Peter experienced, but what Peter experienced also lines up with Scripture. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Right? So this idea of you know, the, the priesthood being destroyed, I, I think it's referring to like the, the, the Levitical priesthood, and then the priesthood of Melchizedek, and the true temple of God, um, and all that sort of thing, the spiritual temple. And then he's going to gather everyone, which is those that believe on Jesus Christ and the Jews, from the Gentiles as well, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So he's just saying like, it's, you know, God had always planned 
to gather Jew and Gentile. This is not like a new plan. That's why he says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. God knew this plan existed, and that's why it's the same salvation for both Jew and Gentile, the same rules, because he was going to gather everyone together. This is actually a quote from Amos 9.11. Um, so I don't know whether he's directly quoting it or just referencing it. It says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden. So why is it to possess the remnant of Eden, but then James says Gentiles? Because I think Edom, if you don't know this, Edom is actually Esau. So Edom is another name for Esau. Esau and Jacob were the two twins, right? Jacob representing the Jews, Esau representing the Gentiles. So this is why he's saying it's referring to the Gentiles, because he's saying they may possess the remnant of Edom, which is the brother of Jacob. And of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth, doeth this. So then he gives a recommendation on what to do. This is James. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write. So he's saying here, we're not going to say that they need to be circumcised to be saved, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas. So it's interesting. This is how Silas comes into the picture. And it's, uh, it's um, I'll touch on that a bit later. Chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. So now... This is what James says. They, they sort of take that on board and then they're going to write a letter now to the church in Antioch with instruction of how they should proceed. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from among us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment, so you see, they're confirming here that we don't believe in work salvation. We believe in salvation by grace. These people are not from us. I don't think it says that they... Uh, when it says here, we've heard that certain which went out from us, I don't think it's that they sent these people down. I think it's a reference like in uh, 1 John that says these were not of us. If they were, they would not have continued with us. They went out of us because they were not of us. So it's these false brethren that ended up going out from them, but they realized they were false brethren subverting their souls. Saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such command. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, uh, they're sending uh, Barsabas and Silas. And they're saying these, like Barnabas and Paul, have also risked their life for the gospel's sake. So these are men of quite high stature within the church. Because stature within the church is by, by who serves the most, right? Not just your, your stature in the world. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So why are they doing this? Because they're sending the letter. But then, you know, Paul and Barnabas fake the letter, right? So then that's why they're sending Two or mouth, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established, they're sending two witnesses as well to go down to the church and also to say, yes, this is a, a true account of what they are recommending to do. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, for which if you keep yourselves, ye you shall do well. Fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, and when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Right? So they not only went there to talk about what was in the letter, but they also went there to preach to them and say, yes, this is, um, and, and exhort them just with preaching as well. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. So Barsabas and Silas come down to preach, to confirm the words of the letter. 
But Silas decides to stay. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So I'm just reading that whole passage just to tell you what's going on. But here's my thoughts on what's happening. Now, why have I said, hey, this is a clash of cultures? Right? Because this is what they're trying to resolve here. I don't believe that this passage is saying that in the New Testament it is, un it is immoral, it is sinful to eat things offered to idols, to eat blood and things like that. Now fornication obviously is. So fornication is, tends to be within those pagan practices, right? And this is why it's included. Now fornication obviously is a sin. But the Bible teaches us about other things. I want to give you the full picture because I don't believe what is being taught here. So the, the, I guess the too long didn't read or you're not listening anymore. Is What I think is going on here is because there's a clash of cultures, right? And when they're giving this recommendation, they're not saying that it's sinful necessarily that you've eaten something off of idols, or even that there are now certain eating laws still in place. I think because they recognize that there are quite, there are Jews there that hold to quite strong traditions, and it's a church of Jew and Gentiles, they're saying, hey, there will be more peace in this church if they just recommend to the Gentiles at least do these things because of the sort of Jews that you associate and you fellowship with in the church in Antioch, right? And this is why James says, hey, there are people in every city that preach Moses, meaning this message of them keeping these traditions is still being preached everywhere, and there are Jews that still hold to these traditions, even though these traditions aren't necessarily applicable in the New Testament anymore. They're not necessarily wrong to do. You know, to, to get circumcised is not wrong to do. It's just if you think you have to be circumcised to be saved, that's the problem, right? So in Colossians 2, a couple, a couple of things, right? So here we get the teaching that we don't keep all these food laws anymore. See, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So this is why we don't need to be circumcised. We are circumcised in Christ. So just like Christ is our sacrifice, he's our Passover, in him we are complete in him. This is why we don't need to keep all these ordinances anymore and the holy days and the meats and drinks and diverse washings because in Christ we are complete. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So see, that even though you don't keep those old Mosaic laws, you're not circumcised, you're still complete in Christ and quickened together and being forgiven of all your sins, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. See, so things changed when he died, and rose again because that whole Levitical priesthood and all the things that came along with it are now done away. And they were temporary. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So in the New Testament, we don't have these food laws anymore. Don't eat this, eat this, clean, unclean. So then you think, well, why in Acts 15 are they saying, well, keep yourself from things strangled, keep yourselves from things sacrificed to idols, keep, your, keep yourselves from blood. They're giving them some food laws and that's okay. This is why I want you to understand that the reason why this is happening is because of the clash of culture. They're not saying that it's sinful for them to do this. What they are teaching here, one is, I'm showing you here in the Colossians, that the food laws are done away, but also in the New Testament, we see this teaching of not using the liberty we have in Jesus Christ to just serve ourselves, but to love one another. So in 1 Corinthians 8, we're also addressing this same issue of this clash of cultures, but in the Corinthian church, right? Not just in the church in Antioch. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols. So here's the eating things sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. 
So what is he saying here? When something's offered and sacrificed to idols, is there any somehow magic over it or anything like that? No, because we know that there's one God and everything else is false. So if you sacrifice it to an idol, it's not like you've changed what this food is. For though there be that are called gods, lowercase g, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, like false gods and lords many, so there's false gods, but there's also just rulers in this world that are not the God. But to us there is but one God, uppercase G, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it, he says, but there is not in every man that knowledge. So not everyone necessarily understands this completely, comprehends this fully. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour. So they still think that there's some power in that statue, in that false god. We know that there's no power because there's no other god but God. But some people think there is some power. And he says, with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So he's saying if you eat something, sacrifice an idol, it doesn't change you at all because nothing's changed with that food. It's the same thing. But take heed. So this is the lesson here, and this is where I'm tying it into what's happening in Acts 15. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours. What's this liberty? To, To know that no matter what you do, it doesn't affect you, but it may affect other people become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit in meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? What does it say here? A weaker brother might go, you know, I don't know whether that's right to do or not. You know, he's an idol, but he sees you sitting in the temple. You know it's nothing. But the fact that you're there eating it, he thinks, oh, maybe it's all right to eat things. You know, it's all right to take part in the table of devils. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. For when ye sin, so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So it's not, see, it's not that you're sinning against yourself. It's not that you're doing something wrong. But then when you don't consider how it impacts others with a weaker conscience, that's where the sin happens. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. This is the love that Paul had. He's expressing here. He's saying, and if I eat meat and it offends my brother, he's just like, I'm not going to eat meat. So he's not saying, therefore, you know, you just cater to everyone's offense in the world. But he's saying here, be considerate about how your actions impact other people. So this is what's being taught in Acts 15. It's that they're saying, hey, we want some peace in the church in Antioch. So at least when you're amongst the Jewish brethren... Keep yourselves from idol, you know, keep yourselves from food and strangled and things like that, lest you offend them. But what is Paul saying here? That the conscience of the Jews is actually the weak one, right? Not the Gentiles. The one that knows that the, that the idol is nothing, they actually have the stronger conscience because they have the, the right knowledge. The weaker conscience is the one that has some false knowledge in there, that there is some power in that idol and therefore their conscience is a bit weaker. So this is what's going on. In Acts 15. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So it's this idea here that things, just just because things are okay to do, that doesn't mean they're good to do. Right? So this is why the question you should be asking yourself when you do something is not are you allowed to do it but rather what is the most loving thing to do you know sometimes i have conversations you know it comes to how you dress how you how you do things what sort of things you do you don't just say well i can do it; it's not a sin yeah sure you can say that but that's not the right attitude you're meant to have right the attitude you're meant to have is like paul here hey all things are lawful for me but all things are not expedient. What is expedient? They're not necessarily good things to do. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. They're not always positively impacting other people. So now we go back to Galatians. So this same theme running through Galatians, right? 
Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the love is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So you see, part of the second great commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, is to consider how your actions impact other people. So just like the Gentiles in the church in Antioch, they wanted to keep some peace, so they gave them some recommendations. Hey, we'll burden with you with these necessary things so that the church is in order. So what is James and the apostles and Barsabas and Silas and Barnabas and Paul, they're all happy to abide by these. These were rules implemented in the church, right? So these were not necessarily commandments of God, but the leadership of the church said, hey, we're going to set some rules so there's order, so there's peace, and there's not offense. So it's the same reason why sometimes I set rules. You know, I set rules because there's a clash of cultures. You get what I'm saying, guys? There's a clash of cultures. So that's why there's rules set to kind of say, hey, we're trying to keep some peace, some harmony, some unity here. Same thing that they're doing in Acts chapter 15. All right, let's spend a bit of time. I'm not going to spend too much time on this last section. Just so you know, we're going to be ending soon. The third section we see is we see a clash of personalities. A clash of personalities. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's unfortunate that there's a clash of personalities. But, um, you know, it happens. Acts 15, 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Now, this isn't exactly follow-up as we think of it. You know, we think of follow-up as going and visiting somebody a few times, you know, because it's very difficult for them to go follow up with churches that are in different cities. They have to travel and, you know, they don't have trains and cars and, and, you know, planes in those days. So it's quite a few days journey, but they did want to go. So this is more so like if you were going to go visit a bunch of churches, you know, like in another country or something. And you, you say, I'm going to go there, you know, like Ashton, he went to America, but he's going to go visit some churches there too. But these are churches that they had some involvement in planting. So this is not exactly like follow-up as we would think of it. It's more like they're traveling and visiting churches on the way. But they had some involvement in it. But this is not a denomination either. Because remember, they don't have the communications back then where they can just easily control churches at a distance. So these churches are operating basically independently. They don't know what's getting preached daily in that church. They don't know how it's being run. But they're going and then they can go there and see how it is and hopefully influence the leadership in the church as they go back and they probably had some influence because they obviously helped to plant that church and they were, the leaders of that church were likely their disciples. So it doesn't mean that they weren't independent. Verse 37, And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Barnabas now wants to go visit, these, visit some churches, but he wants to take Mark with them. Right? And I believe this is the... Um, I, th I think this is the Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark, which is also... Um, actually, no, I don't think so, because I think Mark was... Uh, was uh, is it? No, I'm getting mixed up with Matthew. Sorry. Matthew was the publican. He was one of the 12 disciples. Yeah, Mark is the one that wrote the Gospel of Mark. John, John Mark. So, hey, and that just goes to show as well. Like, that's something I didn't even think in this sermon, that, you know, because I'm going to show you how, like, Mark comes back being profitable to Paul's ministry. But not only that, he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. But Paul thought, look at this, Paul thought not good to take him with him who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. So you see how, unfortunately, there's this clash of personalities in Acts chapter 15. It's not a clash of doctrine. Paul and Barnabas went up to Jerusalem together and said, no, salvation by grace. But now it's just like a, a decision of like, hey, we want to go visit these churches. Who are we going to take with us? And he's like, well, I want to take John Mark. Paul's like, no, we're not taking John Mark. Because last time we took John Mark, he abandoned us. And then there's this dispute of like, well, obviously the dispute was so great that they ended up splitting over it. Now, should they have split over it? Maybe not. But, you know, it's unfortunate sometimes. The unfortunate reality in life is sometimes separation, even between like-minded believers, happens. And we see here they separated. And uh, unfortunately, that was the case. Paul thought it not good with him who separated from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, they, did, they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas. 
So how did Silas come to the church in Antioch? Well, it was because of the dispute in Jerusalem. Did you realize that? So there was the dispute in Antioch. They went to Jerusalem. Barsabas and Silas got sent down. So how did Silas come into Paul's life? Well, it was through a dispute. So, you know, God can work things for good. And now Paul and Silas, you know, they've got their missionary journeys that we know about, which we'll read about in the future, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So like I said, a couple of thoughts on this last passage. It is an unfortunate reality that sometimes even like-minded believers separate. And, you know, you think, you know, different churches separate, can't get along. It's an unfortunate thing, but it happens even to the best of us. I mean, if Barnabas and Saul could disagree over who to take on a missionary journey to the point where they separate, I'm sure Christians today have the same issue, and we see that today. Um, Galatians 13. Look, at this is a dispute even between Abraham and Lot, uncle and nephew. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So even with Abraham and Lot, they had to separate. Um, because of a contention. So, you know, it's never pleasant. It's never a pleasant situation. And I'm, I'm sure we'd all prefer to live life you know, without contention. But, you know, it can be a disagreement in decisions. It can be a disagreement in maybe a direction that you're going. It can be a disagreement in personalities. It can be a disagreement in doctrines or just even how you do things. But... I think what's important is, you know, you can notice here that in Genesis, it wasn't actually that Abraham and Lot had the contention. You notice that? They separated. They, they decided to separate. But who had the contention? It was between the herdmen, right? So what I want you to think about here is, even though sometimes contention cannot be resolved, and sometimes separating is, is inevitable, you want to know that contention doesn't only impact those people that are contending. It's a bit like a marriage. You know, when people divorce, it's like now the friends can't talk together. And now, like, you can't, you know, you can't even invite. It's like my parents. Like, you can't invite them to the same place because you invite one, then it's like they have to separate. And it's all awkward for everyone. And just that happens in churches too, you know, and people contend and it's just awkward forever. So, you need to understand that contention in a church does not just impact you, it impacts the people around you. So make sure you know there's contentions, resolve them. You need to overcome them because it, it impacts the unity of the church just like it impacts the unity between Abraham and Lot. So this is why we must take care with contentions within a church because your contention doesn't just affect you, it also affects those around you. Also, we don't want to let contention discourage you. At least Paul and Barnabas, they had the contention they separated. Thankfully, they still went. They went and served God. You know, we read about the great things that Paul and Silas went on to do as well. Don't let contention discourage you, right? If both parties are still serving the Lord, hey, God can use it for good. You know, we, this is why I say, like, you know, people say, oh, the church, these church split or that church split. Well, ultimately, God wants us to plant different churches, right? So sometimes it may, may just operate that way, that church splits, Hey, now you've got two churches reaching two locations. You know, maybe it will be good in the end, even though it was an unideal way to get there. So you don't want to let contentions discourage you. Make sure you're continuing to serve the Lord. And the last thing I want to say is this, is even in my own life, you know, people I thought I would be serving the Lord with till the end um, have left me. But... You know, I was reading this passage and just starting it out and thinking about it, but, you know, God brought new people into my life as well, you know, the people that are in this church now that I can serve with. And it just reminded me of this situation with uh, Paul, you know. It's like Paul had this dispute with Barnabas and the contention was so sharp between them that they separated. But you can see that God brought him, another person, into his life to serve with him and then he went on to serve with Silas. Um, so, you know, we just, in the same way, you know, God brought Silas into Paul's life, 
Um, and it was because of a dispute over circumcision. And, you know, maybe one day God will bring those who have forsaken you back into your life, like we see here with Mark. So if you remember in Acts 15, the contention was Paul didn't want to go with Mark. But look at what he writes in 2 Timothy 4, and I sort of touched on it before. 2 Timothy 4, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. See, Titus went with him to Jerusalem. Titus was the first bishop in Crete. Titus has a book named after him, and yet Titus was somebody that abandoned Paul. Only Luke is with me, so the Gospel of Luke. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So, you know, life is still a long ways away. You know, maybe things will change around, just like it changed for Mark. But I think it's interesting here in 2 Timothy 4.11. He says, Luke is with me, Mark is profitable for me for the ministry, and those were the two non-12 apostles that wrote Gospels, Luke and Mark. Then you had Matthew, which was the publican, that was a disciple of Jesus, and obviously the Gospel of John. Okay, so in conclusion, just to summarize the lessons that we're trying to take from this passage. First, we had the clash of doctrines, right? Understand salvation well. It's the one doctrine, if any, you should know inside out. And beware of work salvation, because it can come in many subtle forms. Second part of the chapter was a clash of cultures. So sometimes, you know, remember they gave them those rules to put in the church for, for unity and and order and to cause less offense. Sometimes the question to ask yourself in the way you present, the talk, and the way you dress and things like that is not what are you allowed to do, but rather what is the most loving thing to do. It may not be a sin, but it may not be edifying either. And number three, we have this clash of personalities. So just beware of contention, you know, beware of its impact on the people around you. Don't let contentions discourage you and you know there's there's still hope you know time can heal all wounds who knows how life will play out just keep faithfully serving the Lord all right let's pray Lord we thank you for your word and Lord help us to you know be wary of contention in the church help us to know what is right to fight for what is not right to fight for uh, where we can keep peace where we can cause less offense, where we can do things more uh, expedient. So we thank you for the lessons today, Lord, from your word. Pray, Lord, that it will speak and encourage and exhort people here and uh, help us, Lord, to not only live in truth and in grace, but in unity and in peace as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.